Any true flashaholics know that when you prepare for a trip, you always got to pack at least a minimal of two flashlights. Typically, that would include a large one for when manure hits the fan. So for me, that's historically been the Thrun ITN36UT, kind of like the big gun, if you will. And then in terms of an EDC, one that you carry out you at all times for emergency, up until recently, that duty was held by the Menker U11, but I've since sold that. Now in its place is a Nikkor EC30. However, of course, weight is always a consideration, plus not to mention, in case you need to charge the batteries, the requisite chargers and whatnot. So when Wildtech contacted me about reviewing their new recently released A5 with the XHP70 emitter, and more importantly, in a relatively compact form factor, I was like, hmm, that's very interesting. This would make a pretty good emergency light for those long trips. So I was like, sure, sign me up. Now, before we get into the actual review, so the A5 comes in a pretty much typical standard cardboard box and the included accessory has a wrist strap, two spare O-rings, one of these spare USB recharging port cover, and a rather unique USB cable which I'll get into a little bit later. What is really missing though is a nice holster. So as you're checking out these specs, keep in mind that these parameters are for the cool white version but I've received the neutral white version. They unfortunately don't publish a separate set of listings for the neutral white but figure it will be lower overall. All right now that we've got the pleasantries out of the way we get into the meat and potatoes. Right off the bat you can see that there's an anti-reflective coating on the lens. This is a stainless steel non kremlin laid bezel. The A5 does feature a XHP 70 Gen 1 emitter as well as an orange peel reflector and here's a close-up shot. And there are a couple of heat fans, after which is followed by electronic on-off switch. Now while there are these grooved flat facets on the side of the head, it's not really for anti-roll. So this light will go merrily on its own if not placed on a stable surface. And then in terms of the laser engraving, it's simply the manufacturer and model name, as well as various symbols and the serial number. Now on the opposite end of the switch, there is a rubber cover to protect the fairly deep charging port. Now recall that I said earlier about that micro USB cable being unique. And because of that deep charging port, that prong is actually way longer than your standard typical ones. So here, case in point, this is pretty much a standard universal micro USB made by Transmart. And therein, as you can see, the difference. And that's required because, as mentioned, this port goes in fairly deep and there actually is a very semi raised ledge here of maybe, I don't know, less than a millimeter, but still everything contributes to obstructing the standard cable from plugging in confidently. I mean, in a pinch you could use it, but still I would rather stick with this one to make the best contact. Although difficult to see during charging, there is a red LED that lights up, but I do actually like that it's not annoyingly bright, so potentially you could charge this along on your nightstand, because typically most of us have charging cables handily ready, although, of course, one would argue then it would have been preferable if this had been a USB-C as opposed to an older micro USB, but regardless though, there you can see the red LED, and once charging is complete, it'll stay a steady blue. Of note though is that the charging indicator will actually flash purplish, if there is a problem with charging. So let's just say for instance you left it in lockout and you totally forgot to put that on then charging can't commence so it'll flash that way in which case then you just simply twist it back on and then it will start charging. In this case the battery is already full so thus it's blue. Now another condition could also be maybe the battery is defective or whatnot but bottom line is that there is an indicator for abnormal charging. Another interesting thing is that this light can actually be used while it's charging so let's just say you're running low, but you have a power bank and you're charging the light. You could actually use this on the go, but only certain modes can be accessed, such as the Firefly mode or the low mode and then the medium. You cannot access turbo or strobe while it's charging. Now, while this finish is hard anodized, I'm not sure if it's type two or type three, but it seems reasonably tough. The diamond pattern knurling does help aid with the grip, especially, I guess, with glove use and also during an overhand grip as well. The battery tube is a main solid piece and can be screwed independently of the head itself, which is also yet another solid block here. I am encouraged to see that this O-ring is nice and thick, offering a solid seal as one is twisting the head on. Just take it nice and slow so you don't bind the O-ring and as is typical, the advice I always give is to make sure that you lube the underside of the O-ring as well to prevent that binding. The threads are mainly anodized so that way you could lock it out with a quick twist. And then last but not least at the tail end here is attachment for the wrist strap. Of note though is that this end here is nicely rounded so that way it won't dig into flesh or skin during handling. 
Despite the concentric groove on the base, it does allow for perfect tail standing, so thus you could use it in candlelight mode. There is a beefy spring on the tail side end, but not on the head side. Rather, there's only a flat nodule to accept flat top cells, of which the included battery is. And that pretty much caps off the main features of this light. I've sensed so pretty much all of my 26650 size light, with the exception of the PowerTac Hero, of course. This does also serve duty as a power bank, so it is a bit larger. But as you can see, the Wildtech A5 is a fairly compact size light, and even shorter than most of the 18650 size light, up to and including even Nikkor's EC30, which is relatively compact itself. Now this is Night Provisions TX8, their newly released super compact 18650 size light. Oh, in case you're wondering why did I throw in the TN36UT, it's not even the same four factor. Well, because I am considering replacing it with the A5 for long trips and as like the big gun for emergency uses. Batteries also there, the name's up there, but any questions, throw in a comment. I do like the compact form factor for 26650 size light, and it is fairly easy to use and hold in the hand. I really don't think it should cause anybody with ailment issues any problems. However, I do find the switch is a little bit difficult to find immediately as you're groping around in the dark, because the charging port is also rubber as well, and not to mention this, it's slightly raised, so again, not the easiest, but still easy to actually use once you find it and feels just right when used in the overhand mode, allowing one to use their digits to either activate or change the modes. I'm a huge fan of lights that allow you to easily access the lowest mode as well as the highest mode directly from off. And the A5 achieves that by pressing and holding until you access the firefly mode or from either on or off two quick presses will invoke the turbo mode and to exit out of there simply press again to shut off the light. Now with the light on in order to select a different mode simply press and hold to cycle through low, medium, high. Now let's just say you stop at medium. The next time you cycle through again it will always cycle from the low again as you can see there. It does feature memory mode so I'm just going to leave it there, shut the light off turn it back on and it does memorize it not just through the battery change which I'm simulating here but the light actually strangely remembers that it was on as well not necessarily sure that's a pro or con I suppose it's up to each individual's preferences but for what it's worth just mentioning that now there is also a hidden strobe mode and how that's accessed is from turbo mode another two quick presses will invoke the strobe it's a fixed rate strobe that can never be memorized. To exit, just simply click again and it will shut the light off. And that's it. It's a very straightforward UI. So it's now just a little bit after 7 and the sun is pretty much setting here in the northeast. And I picked this scene because it has kind of good combination everything. You got a stone over there that has some brownish uh, earth tone tints in it. Then a darker stone over there that's mostly dark gray. What I'm seeing on the screen is fairly accurate in terms of what I'm seeing in real life and then of course the greens there. Now the A5 has what I would say is more of a greenish neutral tint. Okay, so you can see here, um, I'm going to focus on this stone because it really highlights that fact. Then one of my all-time favorite tints is that from Prometheus Alpha which carries an older emitter XML T5. And there, and you could see the difference. To me, of course, this is subjective, but I've always really enjoyed the tint from this particular light a lot. So, overall, I think right there, when you transition one right after the other, this is the A5, and it's the Prometheus, you could really see the difference in terms of the tint. So, not horrible by any means, but not exactly what I would call a true neutral white there is a greenish tint to it overall. And here it is on the shrubbery. So obviously on a green object it's not as discernible. Pretty much you have it side by side, right? A5 on the right here, Prometheus on the left, but it really becomes apparent on lighter shade objects like that white stone there. So this is to Prometheus and again the ZA5. And not to belabor the point, but here's a white flower pot with the stone pavement as well as some plants. 
here's the A5. The Prometheus. Side by side. A5 on the right, Prometheus on the left. Of course, it does matter that your screen color calibration because you may not be able to see this as clearly, but again, A5 and then the Prometheus. So now we get to some outdoor night shots. This is a typical street about three car width wide. And to start off is the Thorfire TK18 neutral white. This is on max. Say the trees are roughly about 120-ish feet away. And unfortunately the white balance, I couldn't quite lock it down, but there's in real life it's not as green, it's more of a neutral-ish color. Now we have Nikkor's EC30. This is a cool white, but again, there's a slight greenish cast to the tint here right now versus what I'm seeing in real life. Now we have Through Night's TN36UT. And you can see this thing's just a wall of light. Sorry, it's a little late, so I don't really don't want to disturb my neighbors. And last but not least, we have Wildtax A5. As you can see, this has a very good combination and smooth beam in the middle. Um, also, in real life, it's not as green. It's a decent neutral here. Now on a stone walkway, control scene is pretty accurate. First up is a Thorfire TK-18. So are much shorter distances, so it does seem a little brighter than the earlier street view. Now we have Nikkor's EC30. the TN36UT. And then Wildtax A5. I have to say at night, the A5's neutral tint is actually quite nice. In terms of the beam angle, the center hotspot is roughly about 40 degrees wide, while I would say the overall is anywhere between 80 to 90 degrees. Given I don't really have a good white wall to run this off of, I'm just doing a tabletop white paper to show you the beam, but overall the hotspot smoothly transitions out. And the only thing is that it's really the hotspot that has that neutral tint, whereas the outer corona has more of a cool white tint to it.
Now this transition here looks a little bit exaggerated on video. In real life it's much smoother. And also the tint is not quite as green as I'm seeing in real life. Before we dive into the details of this runtime chart, again one thing to keep in mind is that this quoted 3650 lumens is for the cool white version. I did review this neutral white version. With that out of the way, Let's first get into the supply battery, which is this line here, the Wildtech battery. It is rated at five amp hours. I believe it does have a PCB, and it did start at 4.19 volts at the start of this test, with the ending voltage of 2.95. But bottom line is that I did record 3,120 lumens. It does take a fairly steep dive after the first few initial seconds, then kind of does a step down to roughly about 1750 lumens or so. Maintains that for over a little bit over half an hour and then does another secondary step down and then quasi maintains that in a semi-regulated mode until it finally can no longer sustain it, ultimately lasting for about 100 minutes. Now this does fall short of the claimed run times, but again, like I said, I don't have the manufacturer specs for the neutral white version. So thus again, reminder, this is for the cool white version. The room temperature was 73 degrees. Now the light does get pretty hot, especially here. So anytime you see the temperature ramping up, it does indicate it is trying to boost in order to maintain regulation until finally it did that step down, which is started cooling off. But still, because it was still doing semi quasi regulation, the temperature didn't drop off appreciably until finally it just shut off. As a friendly reminder, Anything at 120 or above is considered scalding, so just be careful. You don't want to run this light continuously on turbo mode. Now, the second battery I tried with was a older Enipower IMR, and it did seem to record slightly higher in terms of the lumens, but ultimately, though, due to the lower capacity, as well as it being an older battery, it was roughly 67% of the total runtime of the original Wildtech battery. I will try to reach out to Wildtech to see whether or not they can supply the actual neutral white specs. I will be taking a trip in the near future and I do feel pretty confident about taking the Wildtech A5 in lieu of the TN36UT. Now the main reason for that is because it does serve the purpose of a decently bright output and yet has pretty decent throw despite the orange peel reflector. And although there is a step down, it still does link around the 1700 lumens range. So I do feel that this is more than sufficient. As you can see, the reason why my TN36 UT shots were so low was because I just didn't want to disturb my neighbors. And it, it was just truly more light than I needed. So I feel that this is more than sufficient. Also, I do like the form factor. It's very easy to carry. But more importantly, on a trip, I don't have to carry any extra chargers. I could just simply charge it via the micro USB port. Granted, I do have to carry that unique cable, but still, at the end, it does save quite a bit of weight overall. As I have mentioned earlier in the packaging and accessory section that the A5 does scream for a nice holster, which I will probably be trying the Manker MK41. It is a little bit too big for this, but at least for now until I find something else more compatible. But in summary though, I do find the A5 to be a very capable light with a very easy to use UI. I do love the fact that you can easily access both the lowest mode, which is the Firefly, as well as the highest mode, which is the Turbo, from off. Plus not to mention, in case strobe is required, it is there, but it's hidden and you would never accidentally cycle through it as you're going through the output levels. Now the only con that I would say is the tint is not quite right. Now this is not fully accurate, but still it does tend to have a slightly greenish tint to it. But in consideration of the specific use case, I'm not really too concerned about that, at least for me personally. However though, in consideration of the price, I think right now the only thing comparable that they do have with their sister company, Through Night, is the newly released TC20, but that's, I would say close to nearly, but that's a, but that's at least a good $20, $30 more. Now granted, I don't have too many 26, 650 size lights in my collection, but it's obvious why, it's because of the size. However though, now with the A5, I'm actually looking forward to future releases to see other similar size light, especially if it's this compact. But bottom line, it does have a lot going for it. It offers decent bang for the buck, 
And I have to caveat that with, again, I am just not as in tune with the 26650 size market. I will be providing updates in the future should I gain exposure to a few more lights. But for now, the A5 will be solidly remaining in my collection, especially as a big emergency light on long trips. As part of FTC disclosure, the Wildtech A5 kit was provided by Wildtech for review. Thanks again for watching.